Plants are all around us. However, not all plants look the same to us. They don't have all the same feel. There's plants that are underwater. There's plants that are on land. But do we look at all plants as being equal? Do we look at all parts of the landscape as being equal? I don't think so. That's part of what we're going to look at next. Have you ever noticed how sometimes you'll visit some place, maybe it's a, a particular part of the country, a particular part of an island, some place, and there's something about it that just feels right. It feels like it's home. Well, there's probably a good reason for that, feeling like home, and you're probably not even really aware of exactly what it is. And it turns out that oftentimes, the things that are signaling you to think, wow, this just feels like a home place to me, are the plants that are around you. Deep back in the history of our ancestors, there would have been a time that one of them moved from their ancestral home to a new kind of environment. And when they did so, there were probably quite a few things they missed. Well, all of us have traveled, and when you travel abroad, there's certain things you miss at home. A lot of times it's foods, sometimes it's uh, a particular view, sometimes it's other people. And so one of the solutions to this is to bring along with you the things that you know you tend to miss a lot. And it turns out that a lot of these things are plants. And so the phenomena that we're going to talk about next is the phenomena of transported landscapes. Because it turns out that throughout human history and prehistory, people have been uh, building relationships with plants and with particular environments around them, and then moving these to new places that they set up their new lifestyle in. And so everywhere people have gone, they end up changing the environment they move into. Even if it's a great environment, they end up changing it in some way that makes it feel more like home. Now obviously the next generation of people doesn't know the prior place, and so you know that's now home to them. And if they were to move on, they'd move on with a little bit different transported landscape. There's a long history of this movement, adaptation, movement, adaptation. And we can imagine that this has gone on for thousands and thousands of years as people have spread around just about the entire face of the earth. Behind me is the Waianae Coast, and this is what it might have looked like when the first people arrived here. We don't see very many food plants. Uh, we don't see plants that would be useful for timber. We don't see most of the things that people would need to sustain life. And so if you were a, a new colonist moving to this environment, and you came and you saw this, you probably experienced the great fishing that's adjacent to us, but you knew that you needed more than that to sustain life and really have a, a successful colony. And so you probably went back home, gathered up a lot of the things that you knew you would need, the things you knew uh, that were important for your life, and you would bring them with you and you would plant them out in this environment. This is Waiahole Valley, and what you're seeing is a transported landscape. Very little of this valley would have looked like this when the first people arrived here. What happened was, was that they transformed it. They made it into this beautiful scene that we see, but this is entirely a human-made scene. So the various plants you see are food plants and medicinal plants and plants for other purposes. And all of this has been modified in a way that it looks pleasing to people and it looks useful to people. Throughout the rest of this presentation, I'm going to show you several different kinds of transported landscapes and try to present the idea that there's more than one way to look at the world and there's more than one kind of ideal that people hold. And what I, what I hope you take home from this is the, the, the clear understanding that not all cultures have the same ideal view of how the landscape around them should look. And secondly, and it's a little more subtle, is the point that the, the kind of landscape that you see as being appropriate a lot of times is dictated by the food plants that you use. And this has ramifications that go well beyond the age now. In the end of this, I'll actually take us to the space age and point out how people's transported landscapes and their worldviews, particularly their worldviews of the kinds of foods they use, uh, 
modify and are basically dictating the way that NASA is developing space missions. This, this slide illustrates the major centers of crop diversity around the world. The larger dots on it show areas where there's been large numbers of species domesticated, both of plants and animals, and the smaller dots show areas where there's been far less, uh, far, far fewer species domesticated. One of the important points of this is that most of these dots have something in common. And the thing that they have in common is that the major domesticates that were found from there are grasses and uh, annual legumes or perennial legumes. And so we have beans and grains. And when you put these two together, this is a diet that accounts for most of the diets of people around the earth. And there's some interesting ramifications that come out of this. Because if you eat that kind of diet, you live in a grassland, whether it's a natural grassland where these grasses and legumes would have grown on their own, or whether it's an artificial grassland that you have made. The key point is that if your culture is derived from one of these centers where this kind of agriculture was developed, a grassland is really an important thing to you. And uh, I, I hope you get to see some of the interesting aspects and think about your own culture and how life around you is impacted by people whose focus is on grasslands. This illustrates the importance of grasses around the world. You'll recognize most of these as grains that are eaten by almost everybody every day. Um, and in fact, it turns out that most humans on Earth eat these every day and sustain themselves with these grasses. Even the word agriculture that we've been using to apply to uh, people who farm actually literally means people who grow grasses. And you think about it, that's a real big bias. What about people who grow potatoes or who grow orchards of fruit? Well, is that really agriculture? Well, by definition, it's not. And yet the whole bias of society about agriculture is bent towards grains uh, and the other crops that can grow well with them. If we consider the largest center of origin of agriculture where grain crops were developed, it's the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. And what we see is that uh, agriculture developed after the last glaciation, um, and particularly in the areas of Turkey and Iraq. And this is really important because there haven't been any major climactic changes to that environment since then. In addition, when we look at uh, the Fertile Crescent agriculture, it's focused on grasslands. And when we see how people deal with other kinds of environments, this is what we see. We see that if they encounter trees, they have to remove them because you need a grassland, you don't need a forest. Uh, when people are harvesting, they're actually harvesting on a seasonal basis. And so they will have no food being harvested for a long period of time and then suddenly they'll harvest lots of food, way more than they're going to eat then, and they have to store that. Sometimes they actually have more food produced than they're going to need for the following year, so they have a surplus, and they have to do something with this. And then they have to develop a whole system for distributing that food across the whole year until the next time that they can harvest grains. One of the side effects that's negative of this whole system is that throughout part of history, people were developing grasslands in the edges of natural grasslands and deserts. And these marginal areas were really susceptible to human farming practices that damaged them. And so we have a phenomenon of desertification in North Africa and parts of the Middle East and actually quite a few other parts of the world where because people were farming, and particularly farming grasses, uh, they caused the expansion of natural deserts and the development of artificial deserts. The key thing, once again, I can't say this too many times, is that this kind of agriculture is focused on growing grasses and on growing legumes or beans. And one of the, an additional point to note is that the kinds of animals that are domesticated are also the animals of grasslands. When you think of cows and sheep and donkeys and all these animals, almost all of these animals are animals of grasslands. They're not animals of the forest, they're not animals of swamps, they're animals of grasslands.
we'll shift our focus next to the agricultural center of Sahul, which is the area of New Guinea. Within the Sahul region, agriculture developed at an earlier time than it did in the Fertile Crescent. And in this case, it developed during the glaciation. And this is partly because people had access to lands uh, in the tropics that were not really accessible or suitable in the temperate zones. So here we find agriculture developing up to 26, maybe 30,000 years ago, and it develops in quite a different way. Here people develop agriculture that's really built around swamps and intensification of swamps rather than grasslands. <coughs> so here if people encounter trees, rather than cutting them down as grassland people do, uh, they tend to try to line them up along the edges of their swamp because they're really important to help stabilize the mud to keep it from all flowing away. Here, instead of harvesting crops at a certain period of the year, they harvest them as they need them. So they don't really develop the idea of having a surplus of a crop. Why would you do this? You just leave it in the ground and the surplus sits there. So uh, just the whole idea of having a, a massive surplus and having to have a distribution network for it never really develops. There's no point in it. And as people developed swampland agriculture, probably this began along the edges of rivers and natural swamps, but over time they had to move and get more land. And so what we see is the development of artificial swamplands, places where people flood a forest or flood a grassland area to make it into a swamp. And so the fundamental difference here is that these people would be expanding the size of swamps and decreasing the size of forests and grasslands, um, but using those other two in very different ways than a grassland focus would. And here the crops are also very different. They're focused upon root crops and tree fruit crops and nuts. So there's actually very, very few grasses and the few that are there are things like sugarcane and, and a couple of sugarcane relatives that you can eat. Um, but they're not really focused on eating the seeds uh, such as we would have with corn or wheat or, or rice. In addition, there's actually only a very few legumes that are involved. And most of the legumes that are involved are either not eaten as food, they're used for other things like fish poisons, uh, or they are large trees that produce big legumes. And so this is kind of a different way of approaching life. So if we look at what life is like when you're focused on a farm in a swamp, what you can see is that the level of biodiversity that's found within a swamp farm is really high. There's a really important uh, role for high biodiversity, whereas if you have a field of grasses, you have low biodiversity. And you might ask, well, why would this be the case? Well, here's the reason why. If you have grasses and you need to harvest them at one time of the year, each plant's pretty small and you plant them close together. If you have a lot of different species of grasses all together, then the harvest is really hard because one of them comes ripe at one time, one comes ripe at another time, and how do you separate them all out? You make a big mess. But if you have one species of the same variety and they all get ripe at the same time, you go out and you harvest that field and then you're done. Makes sense. The opposite is true in the swamp. If you're not planning to harvest everything all at one time, you want things to be spread out when they are harvestable. And you want to have a diversity of the food you eat. And so you try to maximize the diversity in any field. And so the really ideal swamp crop is one that can be mixed in with lots of other crops and has a variable rate of harvest. You don't want them to all come ripe at the same time. Next, the technologies that are used in swamps tend to be very different than those that are developed for grasslands because you're not having to process dried, stored grains. Instead, you're processing fresh foods that you've just harvested or are very recently harvested from your swamp. And so the whole system of technologies that's developed is quite different. Next piece about swamps that's interesting is that in a grassland, you don't really want to live out in the grasses. You want to live maybe in the edge of a forest or in a little more protected area, but there's not really an advantage of living in the middle of your field. However, with a swamp, there's a huge advantage of living within the edge of the swamp. 
partly because swamps are difficult to cross, and partly because you want to be able to keep an eye on your food and you don't want to have to haul your food a long ways home. And so you oftentimes find people who are growing swamp foods living in the swamp, so they're very much integrated with the environment around them. And lastly, the productivity of swamps and grassland is very different. Both are high productivity systems. However, the nature of the plants that are in them is very different. So in a grassland, the normal mechanism that the ecology takes advantage of is storage of lots of nutrients within the soil. Oftentimes grasslands have really deep soils, many, many feet deep. And so the nutrients that are in the grass and the plants that are on top is actually a, only a small percent of the total nutrition in the system. So the productivity of the system is based upon the soil. And so you'll see agricultural uh, farmers are very focused on the fertility of the soil. In a swamp, it's almost the opposite. <coughs> There's actually a very low level of productivity in the mud of the swamp itself and in the water of the swamp itself. Most of the nutrition is stored up in the plants of the swamp. And whether these are trees or whether these are bushes or vines or herbaceous plants, that's where the nutrients are at. And so if you farm in a swamp, you learn that if you want to introduce nutrients into your plants, you have to burn the other plants that are there. You have to get those nutrients released so that they can be taken up by your plants that you're growing. And secondly, the plants that you are growing are the place that the nutrients are stored. And so uh, this, this means that leaving your plants out in the field is a good way to save nutrients in your field. So you think about it, the whole logic, the difference between these two systems, you can see how it's really diverging at this point. One farmer is trying to build up the nutrients in the soil and not necessarily his crop. The other farmer is trying to build up the nutrients in his crop and not necessarily the soil. Quite opposite, and they have very different ramifications. These are some of the characteristics of swamp crops. Uh, first and foremost is probably uh, the piece that's the most unusual to people who are accustomed to growing plants by seeds. And this is that most of the swamp crops can be grown from cuttings or from shoot suckers. And this is a very different way of growing plants. It's basically cloning them and propagating them that way. The advantage of this system is that you are able to get lots of plants that are exactly what you want them to be. So if you select a particular variety and then you, you propagate it by, with clones, you're going to have that same variety everywhere you stick it in the ground. The disadvantage of this is that these kinds of systems that are clonally propagated are far more susceptible to diseases that come in because you need genetic diversity to be resistant to diseases. However, when you consider the issue of biodiversity within a swamp system and recall that the goal is to have a highly diverse system of species, it basically takes care of this issue of clonally propagating. So it balances it out where you get what you want by clonally propagating but you don't have the fear because there's lots of different species within your farm. The second issue is that uh, these kinds of plants grow well in nutrient poor areas and so this means you don't have to have lots of nutrients for them to grow. Now if you give them lots of nutrients they grow a lot better but it doesn't mean they won't grow without nutrients whereas a lot of the grass crops don't do so hot if you don't have nutrients. So you tend to find farmers of grasses focusing on the best nutrient soils and farmers who live in swamps not being concerned about this issue. They'd like those high nutrients too, but if they don't have them, that's okay. Swamp crops require very little soil, but they require lots of water, and this is probably the biggest strength and weakness of swamp crops. Uh, if for some reason you have a drought and things really dry out, it may be really hard to keep your swamp going and therefore keep your swamp crops going. However, if you don't have a whole lot of soil, you can actually plant a lot of swamp crops in a pile of rocks and they will do fine. Fourth, swamp crops are, are very highly energy efficient. And what I mean by this is that they are able to transform the energy that they take in from photosynthesis and convert that mostly into the end product that people want, which is usually carbohydrates, but it could be other things, proteins.
So they're very highly efficient, and therefore we say that they have a high nutrition to photosynthesis ratio. And what this means is that if we had a field of taro, which is a swamp crop, it is converting most of the sunlight that it receives into a useful carbohydrate for people. Within the Sahul region, there were a number of trees that were domesticated that are partners within these swamp systems. They grow well in a swamp, they grow well with other swamp crops, and they help to stabilize the edges of the swamp. Some examples of these include sago palms and their relatives, breadfruit and quite a few relatives, nolly nut and cut nut, and Tahitian chestnuts. Some of these swamp and lowland forest trees that have been domesticated in Sahul include nutmeg and cloves, quite a few different species of figs or ficus, and some of their relatives that includes important plants such as vauke, hibiscus, and quite a few relatives of hibiscus such as hao. Probably the most important swamp crops are those that are harvest or that are grown for their edible roots. These include taro and lots of relatives in the er Eraceae family, tea and quite a few relatives of it, yams and all of its relatives, uh, ginger and other ginger-like and uh, relatives of gingers. Some of the other important swamp crops that we get from the Sahul region include bananas, sugarcane, gourds, kava, black pepper, and the various rattans that are used in furniture making and other purposes. Cultivation within swamps is, and particularly tropical swamps, is focused on a combination of using trees and herbs. It, we use vegetative reproduction. The environment in which all of this is taking place is moist and humid. There's very low soil fertility, and there's not much soil. Uh, an issue that I haven't addressed prior to this is the fact that swamps are well known as being pollution filters and are excellent places for detoxifying uh, toxins that occur elsewhere in a system. So you might have a pollutant that enters a river, that river then flows down through a swamp, and the pollutant is removed by the plants of the swamp. And a key thing here is that nutrients within a swamp are held within the plants of the swamp and not in the soils. I'll come back to all of this in a, in a minute when I start discussing space travel, so keep all of this in mind. So I want to relate to you a story that I was told when I was living on the island of Rotuma. And, and this is a story that is uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek, and it's one that Rotumans tell about themselves and that their uh, friends in the, island of, or in the Fijian islands tell about them as well in kind of a joking way. So we don't know if this is true or not, but uh, hopefully uh, there's a point to be made here. In the 1700s, British ships arrived at the island of Rotuma, and they brought along with them lots of trade goods that they had. They had their own foods that they had been bringing around. And one of the common phenomena that happened at these islands was the sailors would be really tired of eating the ship's foods, which were usually dried foods. And they would eagerly trade these for fresh foods from the islanders. So at the island of Rotuma, the story goes, a farmer came down to the beach when a ship arrived, and the people from the ship gave him a box of crackers or biscuits. And he took these biscuits and he tried them and he liked them, and so he gave them a pig or something of value to take ashore. And so it looked like it was a good trade. So the ship's crew went back to their ship, and the farmer went back to his farm. A few days later, uh, the same kind of transactions were happening and the farmer shows up at the beach and he's really upset and uh, he accuses the uh, ship's people of uh, robbing him and there's a discussion that ensues and uh, everybody's kind of wondering you know what's this farmer all upset about <coughs> well it turns out that the farmer says this is what happened he ate one of the crackers and he said yes these are very good I like these biscuits and because he liked the way they taste it, he took them out to his farm and he planted a few of them. Well, he came by a couple of days later to see if they had sprouted and instead they had just all rotted into a mush. And he knew these weren't any good. So he came back to complain to the ship's crew telling them, you know, these crackers are no good. Well, so the joke here 
is that Ratumans are sometimes referred to as biscuit planters. And although this is a tongue-in-cheek joke, it actually tells us something about their traditional agricultural system. It tells us that they were swamp cultivators because the part of the plant that you could eat, you could also plant and grow as a food. And in fact, if you were going to eat it, you probably could plant it. And so he did a very logical thing. He was given a food that he liked, and he went out and planted it. This is a very different perspective on agriculture than the people on the ship had, who probably thought such a thing was quite silly. Okay, I'm going to shift gears once again, and this time we're going to look at some of what NASA has been doing, trying to enable us to have life in space, or at least to take humans from here to somewhere else. And in particular, I'm going to focus on what would be involved in having a human mission to Mars, where people actually physically go to Mars and try to survive on the way there and while they're there and on the way back. These are some drawings that NASA has posted that illustrate an example of a kind of ship that they've been working on developing. You can see that this particular ship is three levels and it's intended to meet lots of different kinds of human needs. In addition to building these simulators of a ship, They've also poked people inside one of these ships and had them survive in there for 30, 60, and 90 days just to see how it would work. NASA has worked on developing crops that they would grow in space, and they've tested lots of different kinds of crops. And when you look at the lists of plants that they've tested and rejected, uh, what you find is that most of these are crops of grasslands. When you look at the crops that they've accepted, what you see is that they're divided between seed crops that are grassland crops for the most part and sahul style crops that you can propagate using cuttings of the stem or pieces of roots. One of the problems that NASA has found with growing grassland crops in space is that you plant a seed, let's say in less than earth gravity, it grows, it grows fine, it grows a plant, that plant produces seeds and then you take the seeds from that plant and you plant them and you expect new plants to grow and nothing happens. And one of the funny things is it turns out that if you grow earth plants in pretty much anything less than earth gravity, the proteins that are in the seeds don't precipitate properly and the seeds that are produced are oftentimes sterile. And therefore this means that there's a huge limitation on the ability of farmers in space they either have to maintain an earth gravity, which is very expensive to do in space, or they have to come up with an alternative solution to planting plants with seeds. In the lower part of this slide, you see an image of a uh, stow processor that has a salad machine in it. And what this salad machine is, is it, it's a, a machine that plants the seed of a lettuce plant, and that seed is in some kind of soil and it slowly moves over and it starts to grow and through the course of time this grows up until it produces a head of lettuce that can be harvested and eaten as a salad. Now normally a farmer who grows lettuce also grows some that become seeds and they would then collect those seeds and plant them. Notice the diagram that is to the right shows an astronaut floating in space. He has some processors below him and he has three containers that appear to have a grassland in space. I think this is kind of important. It tells us that the engineers who have been working on these kinds of things have a grassland mentality, and they assume that agriculture in space must consist of grasslands. This is a very logical thing. It's not an insult to them. It shows that they're well acculturated, that they think of food as coming from grasslands. When we consider life in space, there are several issues that NASA has had to deal with. <coughs> Some of these involve the environment of the spaceship itself. When astronauts enter a small spaceship and breathe the air that's in a small contained area, one of the main things that happen is that humans are not very good traps of moisture. When we exhale, we send lots of water out through our breath, and this rapidly sends the humidity of a small room to more than 100%. This humidity precipitates on the walls and everything else. And so a spaceship rapidly becomes a very moist and humid environment. One of the problems in space is that there's not very much soil. S having soil is an expensive thing to have. 
and there's a very limited area in which you can grow plants. So if you want to grow plants, a lot of times they'll look at hydroponics or other such issues because you, you want to try to grow plants without soil or at least try to minimize it. Secondly, or thirdly, there's a limited amount of atmosphere. And so you have to be able to do everything you're doing both in a small space and use a small amount of air. Now let's think about swamp plants. There's some advantages of swamp plants. The first of which is they do well in a moist and humid environment. The second is they don't need much soil and they grow pretty well in limited areas. <clears throat> I've already mentioned that swamps are natural pollution filters and it makes sense that a swamp in space would help to get rid of pollutants that would be generated by people. An issue that I hadn't really mentioned before but that I'll go into now is the fact that swamp plants have can be reproduced vegetatively is really important. As I mentioned before, plants that are growing in a low gravity that produce seeds, produce seeds that are not able to germinate properly and therefore can't grow new plants. And if you're traveling from here to Mars, you probably can't take enough seeds along to meet all of your needs. So instead, you need to be able to have some of your plants grow to the point that they produce seeds that you can then plant. So this is really important. Well, another of the advantages of swamp plants is that you don't have to ever do that. You don't have to produce viable seeds. Who cares? You can just plant cuttings. That's what the whole system's set up to do. And you're very confident that those cuttings are gonna grow the kinds of things that you want them to grow. What I would propose is that NASA is not only looking at the wrong plants and should probably be looking more at swamp plants instead of these grasses, but probably NASA is also looking at the wrong astronauts. An issue that I haven't really gone into, but maybe is propped up in some of your minds, is that the people who develop these swampland agriculture systems are the same people who populated many small Pacific islands, particularly atolls, where there's very limited environments, very few resources. People end up eating the same foods every day, morning, noon, evening, day after day after day, and they basically have survived in the equivalent of a spaceship. And so what I propose to NASA is that they not only stop considering these grasses and think about swamp plants, but they, they also consider the people who know how to grow swamp plants. And so they should be looking at Pacific Islanders as these people who developed these crops and colonized a long time ago places that are relatively inhospitable, maybe not as inhospitable as Mars, but definitely more inhospitable than the average grassland. So let's revisit the transported landscape that we saw in Wayahole. Transported landscapes are made up of several different kinds of elements. First of all, we can think of elements that are the biological organisms. Some of these are organisms that were intentionally introduced, plants, animals, and so forth, that people brought with them because they wanted to bring them with them. And some are unintentionally introduced. There's also elements of the transported landscape that are the cultural concepts that go with these plants and animals that are introduced. These include ideas such as resource management systems and what's considered to be beautiful or attractive and the aesthetic arrangement that's appropriate. Probably many of you have uh, planted something in your yard or have dealt with uh, potted plants or have gone to a park and seen how plants are arranged. They're, they're not arranged randomly. They're put in in a way that's considered to be attractive. And sometimes you'll find something attractive and sometimes you'll find it unattractive. But the point is, is that this is actually a part of the transported landscape. It's not just the organisms it's also the way in which those organisms are expected to interrelate with each other. When we look at oceanic transported landscapes, we have a number of kinds of introduced plants. These are oftentimes the ones used for food and medicines. Then we have some unintentional plants that were introduced. These include things that don't have a particular use, but might be grown from seeds that got stuck in people's clothing, or seeds that blew into a basket that was used to carry something else. 
There's some intentional animals. These include rats, pigs, dogs, and chickens. And some of you might think, well, was a rat intentional? Well, actually, in quite a few cultures, people eat rats, and so it's highly likely that rats were intentionally introduced as foods. There's also some animals that have been unintentionally introduced. These include geckos, skinks, spiders, cockroaches, quite a few different kinds of snails, and lice. Some other kinds of organisms that have been unintentionally introduced include diseases and soil microbes. Each time somebody dug up a plant from their swamp, it had a little bit of soil on it and that had microbes in it. And when they moved to a new area, they basically transported those microbes. This is actually a part of the transported landscape that is very poorly documented. When people move plants, they do some things that actually benefit the cultural landscapes. So some examples of this, include swamp species. So because people moving from Sahul were trying to increase the area of swamps, species that naturally live in swamps tend to benefit from the kinds of things that people do. Well, high on the list of plants that benefit from the things people do include the food plants. Secondly, species of the strand area or the coastal forest also tended to uh, benefit from the presence of people because people tend to propagate the plants that are very useful for them. Third is shallow water marine algae. There's quite a few species that people have learned to eat. These are probably all benefited from the fishing activities of people that reduce the levels of fish that are preying on these algae. And fourth, we have a lot of species that move in early into a successional cycle. So if we were to look at a forest that had either been cut down or burned down or, or had slipped down a slope, there are certain species that rapidly invade that open soil, that new area. And these are considered early successional species. And a lot of these are ones that benefit from the presence of humans. Nowadays, we refer to a lot of these as weeds, um, but that's not always been the case. So these kinds of plants, early successional species such as weeds, uh, oftentimes have benefited from human activities. However, not all changes that have happened because of people have been beneficial. There's quite a few kinds of plants that suffer from cultural landscapes because this is always a trade-off. Anytime one species wins, it means it's at the cost of another species. Another species has lost something. So the lowland forests also contain many herbaceous species and a lot of these didn't have a lot of cultural uses. Uh, these species probably also uh, suffered. Some of them probably went extinct. Trees and herbs that, also, that had few cultural uses uh, also would have been either weeded out over time or at least not cared for and therefore failed to thrive. Lastly, and this is probably one of the most important ones, across the Pacific Islands, the drier that an environment was that people moved into, the less likely it was that the native species of that environment would persist and survive. The converse is true as well. The wetter an environment was, the more likely it was that the native species of that environment would survive and thrive. And so we see that plants that are native to dry areas or other kinds of fragile environments uh, suffer at the hands of humans. Same kinds of issues happen with animals. We have some animals that suffer from cultural landscapes. Uh, this, in, generally speaking, includes seabirds, especially ground nesting species. They probably didn't suffer as much from people as from the other animals that we introduced, such as rats and pigs and dogs and chickens that shared with these other animals uh, their diseases and also chased them around and ate them and ate their eggs and so forth. Flightless birds had a really rough time. There's quite a, a, a record of extinctions of flightless birds in the Pacific Islands. It's very controversial as to whether this was directly the impact of people or whether some of these birds were already on a pathway to natural extinction or whether it was something else that killed them off. Lots of possibilities and we don't really know, although the literature mostly points to people as being the cause of their extinction. Some herbivorous fish, those that eat algae, uh, probably suffered at the hands of humans because people were harvesting these to eat them. Quite a few of the lowland land snails have had problems. 
either from introduced snails that people brought in or from people eating the snails or from the other animals we brought in eating snails or from simply just changing the environment so that their natural environment is no longer uh, viable for them. Likewise, there's some animals that have benefited from human uh, landscape activities. These include some species that live in estuaries and swamp bird species. There's good evidence, at least in Hawaii, that birds that lived in swamp areas uh, probably increased in numbers because of the increase of uh, swamps due to human agricultural practices. Uh, desirable herbivorous algae eating fish and carnivorous fish that could be raised in captivity also have benefited from human presence. So fish ponds basically increase certain species of fish and the fish therefore benefits. And finally, the most important animals that probably benefit from all of this human activity are the animals that humans introduced. Because prior to the humans bringing them here, they weren't here at all. After humans brought them here, they're here. That's clearly a benefit to the animals. All right, all of this that I've been talking about has mostly been pointed at the past, but we could equally look at the present and consider modern cultural landscapes. And there's several issues to think about. And, and this is a very individualized and culturally uh, specific task. So each of you should be thinking about your own culture, your own housing situation. So first of all, what is the ideal housing? What's the kind of location that you would really like? What size of a house do you feel is appropriate? What would be too big? What would be too small? What's the primary purpose of your home? Is it just a place to live? Is it just a place to sleep and eat? Or is it a place to entertain? Is it your business? Is it a place to fix cars? What, what, what is your home? What's the purpose of it? Is it a farmhouse? Is it a workhouse? What is it? And then what are some of the secondary purposes of your home? It could be any of those things. What's the ideal physical landscape? If you could have anything that you wanted, what would the view be from your home? What kind of vista would you want to have on the horizon? What kind of soils would you like to have around your home? For some people, concrete is the ideal soil. For others, they want a soil that's really rich that they can grow something in. For others who are well adapted to swamp agriculture, they're not worried about the soil. They know that they can grow their plants with very little. What's the weather like in your ideal home? Do you like it to rain all the time? Do you like it to be sunny all the time? What kind of weather do you like? Do you want it to be hot, cold? Do you like seasonal weather or do you like the moderate tropics? All of these are issues that relate to cultural landscape. In addition, in the modern world, we, we have issues of what an ideal biological environment is. There's certain kinds of plants that we want to see. When I drive through parts of local communities, I see marangai trees. And I know that there are certain ethnic groups that like to see those trees in their yard. It reminds them of home. It, makes, it reminds them of who they are. There are certain animals that people want to have. Some people don't want animals. There are certain kinds of plants that you might want to avoid. You might think about that. What are some plants that you would not want to have around, either because they're dangerous, they're poisonous, they're unlucky, whatever reason. And there's some animals that you might want to avoid. Some people really don't like spiders or ants and go to great extent to try to avoid these. When you're looking for a home or a community, there's something about communities that just feels right. There's elements of the physical environment, the biological environment, and the cultural environment that all contribute to having a landscape that feels like home. And what you find is that frequently when people move to a new community, even if they don't know anybody there, they will naturally gravitate to settling into a home that is in a neighborhood that has many people that have some cultural commonality with them. The reason for this is that people are seeing visual environmental cues of the landscape in the other people's homes that feel homey to them and they then pick a home in that same area because it feels comfortable. Oftentimes after the fact they find out that they have something in common with these other people. Some of the key elements of a cultural landscape include the house types and the locations the kinds of plants and animals that are appropriate for that landscape, 
the organization of the community and the basic features of the landscape. And this is at the large level.